Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. 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 Such a good man of session today talking about what we need to do and give things over to God rather than holding on to them ourselves. So true. So true. And then all of our songs today have been about uh, receiving from God. And there's no telling what God can do. Say the name of Jesus. We had a good prayer today. and I have a message for you that, that may seem like in the beginning it's going to totally go against everything we've sung about today and everything we've talked about. But I feel like that God has confirmed me today what He wants me to tell you. And so I'm going to do that. And I do want the anointing to fall on me today. I don't take standing behind this desk the responsibility lightly. Patty will tell you, even yesterday morning, she came walking to get some ice, and I think it was 4.15, and I was up working on this message. So I, I don't take lightly what God gives me, and when I tell you I feel like the Lord give me something for you, I'm not just saying that to get you excited that God talks to me. No, I'm telling you that because I really believe God has something to say to us today. So I want to direct your attention to Matthew chapter 8, beginning reading at verse number 18, Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse number 18. And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. Unless this is the apostle Paul writing, unless I should be exalted above measure by abundance of the revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Under the leadership of the Holy Ghost this morning, I want to preach to you a message that I have entitled, When God Says No. When God Says No. On the mic, would you pray God's anointing on this message today, please? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. God bless you. you. may be seated. Good worship music this morning. Family, I appreciate that so much. When God says no, the word no is a very harsh word. If you look the word up, no, and at the source, you'll find that some of the words that are synonyms of the word no are rebuff or refusal or rejection. Every single person in here who is old enough to walk on their own is familiar with the word no. Our experience when the word no begins very early in our life. Rusty, no, don't run. Rusty, no, don't touch that. Rusty, no, you can't have that. Rusty, no, don't go near the road. 
Early in life, we become very familiar with the word no. And as we grow older, the no's continue. No, you cannot take the car tonight. No, you cannot borrow $20. And then it continues. No, you're not accepted to this college. No, I will not marry you. No, I will not hire you. No, you do not qualify to buy this house. Whether you've ever stopped to realize it or not, the word no is a part of our life. And it's a part of our life that we cannot avoid. It is one of the first words that we hear as even a wee little child. I heard it this morning as some mothers were correcting your children. No, don't do that. Yeah. And it's a word that will be one of the last words that many of us will hear when a doctor says either no, nothing more can be done, or no, there's nothing <laughs> wrong. It's just that old age has finally caught up with you. No is just a part of life. I said a minute ago that the word no is a very harsh word. It is a word that stings. No one from a child who drops to the floor and throws a tantrum in the Walmart <laughs> when they are told, no, you cannot have that toy. To the adult who has to endure hearing the word, no, you can't buy that Camaro <laughs> because your credit is not good enough. No one enjoys the rebuff and the refusal and the rejection that the word no carries. And especially when that no comes from God. Prayer, the ability, the privilege to pray to an almighty God is amazing. It's, it's incredible. It's intriguing. The apostles were so intrigued when they heard Jesus pray that they were so fascinated when they watched him that in Luke chapter 11, they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us how to do that. Over and over in the Gospels, we read about Jesus teaching about when to pray and about how to pray and about what to expect when we pray. Prayer is a standard. It is the avenue. It is the way that we communicate with our God. Prayer is how a child of God lets God know how much they love Him, how much they appreciate Him. And prayer is the means by which we let God know the things that we need from Him. Paul, in his letter to the church at Philippi, wrote in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Now I'm going to get just real and honest with you this morning and say that there are some times that our requests to God are pretty small. They're pretty insignificant. If you have a commute to your job that takes you on a busy interstate, and you run late, I know none of you ever run late, but, <laughs> but if you run late and your job takes you on an interstate, as you're getting your car, you may bow your head, oh Lord, please don't let there be an accident today. Or you might, before you step on a scale, breathe a pair, Lord, please. <laughs> oh God, uh, don't let me kill anybody today. Let me have lost a pound. Y'all sound like you know all about that. <laughs> we all have at one time or another prayed a prayer that could be probably classified as pretty small, pretty insignificant. But then there are times when we pray that the situation that we're praying about forces us into a different mindset, into a different Degree of desperation. There's a song that was written by Carol Magruder and sung by his wife Priscilla entitled From Heaven's Point of View. And some of the words from that song really illustrate how we feel sometimes 
about what we need from God. Today, I face a mountain that I don't have any strength to climb. For the struggle of this journey left me weak, both in body and in mind. And then where I stand and look to the peak of what I need from you, it's a distance that I just can't reach. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever felt that? It is in times like that that we turn our face toward heaven. And we pray to our Father. We present our petition. And we step out on every ounce of faith that we have and we ask God for that big thing. And because of what we have read in God's word and because of what we have heard preached about and because of what we have heard sung about and testified about, we ask God big and then we expect the answer from God to be a booming sound from heaven that is yes, you get what you've asked for. And sometimes, thank the Lord, that happens. Amen. Amen. Thank God it happens. Everyone in here can testify about it. But the Corey testified about it in his message today. It happens. But then there are times when that answer to that big ask will come back from God. And that answer will be no. And that refusal, that rebuff, that rejection hurts. Especially since it's coming from a God that we know loves us. From a God that we know cares about us as in cons- and is concerned about us. You might as well say, man, you've been there. I've been there. We've all been to the place when God says, No. There is nothing that has more possibility to strike a blow at the faith of a real man or a real woman of God than to have a need. I mean a real need. I mean a desperate, gotta have an answer, need. Go unmet by God. Men and women who have served God faithfully who have tried to live holy, who have tried to do the right things, often have degrees of faith that shout out, God can do anything. We testify about it. And it's true. God can do anything. Christian men and women who have witnessed, who have seen, who have experienced God meet the needs in their church family and in their natural family, who have heard preachers preach about it, God performing the miraculous, who have heard testimonies and reports of how that God has answered prayers in marvelous and astonishing ways. They anticipate, they expect God to meet their need. They pray and they believe. They pray and they anticipate. They pray and they expect God to come to their aid. When a real need arises in the life of a Christian whose faith is in tune with what God is able to do, the first call that they make is not to their doctor. It is not to their counselor. It is not to their banker. The first call when a crisis comes up is to drop on their knees and call out to their God. And that is, and it is at that point, it is then that their expectation for a yes from God is real. And sometimes that yes comes. It may take an hour, or it may take a day, or it may take months, or it may even take years to come to pass, but that yes comes from God. But there have been times that those good, solid, deep, spiritual Christians have come to the realization that that yes answer that they so desperately sought from God 
comes back. No. No. They realize that the God that they have preached about and taught about and testified about being able to do anything is not going to do for them what they have seen him do for others. Their father, their God said no. And it hurts. It hurts. I'm preaching today when God says no. One of the most well-known examples in the Bible of God telling one of His children, no begins in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In verse number 2, David, the giant killer, he's now king. King David said this to the prophet Nathan, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. David was saying, look at where I live. I live in a beautiful place, but I look over at the ark of God and it's in tents. It's in a tent that, that carries the, the situation of the weather is always beating against it. He said, Nathan, I live in a beautiful place, but the ark of God lives in tents. In verse number three, Nathan jumped the gun a little bit when he told David, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. In verse number four, God began to show Nathan the error of his ways. And then he told him to go and tell David some things about his desire to build a house for the Lord. David had a big ask. He asked God, let me build a house for the presence of the Lord. Let me build a house for your ark. Let me build a house for the ark of the covenant. Let me build you a place, God, that would be a place that you can dwell, that your presence could dwell. Let me do it, God. David, the giant killer. David, the mighty warrior, a man who had killed tens of thousands protecting God's people and furthering God's cause in the world. David, not a perfect man, but a man who knew how to seek the face of God. A man who no doubt felt that he surely was one who met the qualifications to have a big ass go to God and to be answered with a yes. David had a big ask. He had a big request. He said, let me build You a house, God. But in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, God told David through the prophet Nathan this, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever in case you didn't get that God answered a prayer from one of his greatest warriors from a man who we know now as a man who was after God's own heart God answers David's big prayer and that answer was no you cannot build me a house One of David's deepest desires, his dream, his passion, his desperate want was to build a house, was to build a temple for his God. The writer of the book of 1 Chronicles wrote in chapter 28 that David pulled together all of the leaders of Israel and the officers of the tribes and the captains of the divisions who served the king. David called together all of the captains over thousands and the captains over hundreds and the stewards over all the substance and the possessions of the king and of his sons with the officials, the valiant men and all of the men of valor. David got all of these prestigious people together And notice what happened in verse number two. Then David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house for the rest of the ark of the covenant of the Lord. 
and for a footstool for our God and had made preparations to build it. But God said to me, ye shall not build a house for my name. God told David, no. David told God, I want to build a house. I want to build a house. It's not for me, God. It's for your presence to dwell in. It makes sense for me to do it, God. I am your man. I am a man who follows after your heart. I have a plan. I have the means. I will make building your house my number one priority, God. Just say yes. Just let me do it, God. David asked and God said, no. I read from you from Matthew 8 about a local disciple of Jesus who after having Jesus come to his community obviously told Jesus that he wanted to join the other disciples and follow him on his journeys. But the man had one request for the Lord. He asked Jesus for one thing. This man was willing to leave his job, his career. He was willing to leave his friends. He was willing to leave his family. Maybe he had a girlfriend that he was willing to leave behind. I don't know. All I know is that this man was willing to leave everything in his life behind to follow Jesus. But he had one request. He asked Jesus for one thing in exchange for giving up his entire life. He asked Jesus for time to go and bury his father. And Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. Jesus looked at the man and he told him, no. David asked God for one big thing and God said, no. A disciple asked Jesus for one thing and I'm sure that to this man it was a big thing and Jesus said, no. I work on my sermons many times very early on Saturday mornings and today's message was no exception. I've been working on this message for about five weeks. I started working last Saturday morning at about 3.45 a.m. Now most of you don't even realize that there's a 3.45 a.m. But there is. And I had been working on this sermon from about 3.45 a.m. And at 6.15 when our dog Oliver jumped down from the couch where he had been sleeping and shook himself, that was my cue to take him out so he can do his business. <laughs> I was waiting patiently while Oliver surveyed the perimeter. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about until he had secured just the right spot. <laughs> and as I stood on our porch holding that lead, I thought to myself, what a time to have to get up from my keyboard talking about two men who have asked God for something much like we do, and God said no. And here I am standing on a porch it feels like right now is the right time in my message where I'm going to reveal something profound about why God says no. And here I am standing on our porch in my pajamas waiting for a dog to do his business. I've heard preaching categorized with words like deep or profound. I heard one the other day, texture. That message has texture. My preaching, to my knowledge, has never been categorized with words like deep or profound or texture. Wouldn't it be great today if I could say something right now that was so profound or so deep or so textured that you would know that what... I was telling you is why God says no. Wouldn't that be awesome if I could right now tell you why God says no? That would be so deep. That would be so profound. Well, interestingly enough, I asked God for the answer to why there are times when he says no. And you know what he told me? God told me no. 
The answer to that question, why does God say no, is God's and God's alone. Let me say that again. The answer as to why God says no is God's and God's alone. But I feel like God did have mercy on me and on this inadequate preacher and he did share something with me that may make us understand things a little better when God says no. There's been something about God that has been absolutely consistent throughout all of God's dealing with mankind. And that thing is that God always has an order of things. God always has an order. In the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, we read how that God, how the earth and everything in it was created. First God created the earth and then he created light and then he separated the waters and then he created the land and the seas and then he created the sun and the moon and the stars and then God created the fish and the birds and then he created land, animals and man. Everything was done in an order. The first three days, God shaped his creation. And the second three days, God populated his creation. There is an order to how God does things. When God sent plagues to soften the heart of Pharaoh, to free Israel from Egyptian bondage, each plague came in an order that it did not diminish or destroy the impact of the next plague to come. Have you ever thought of that? In Exodus chapter 9 and verse 23, God causes thunder and hail and fire to strike the ground. That was the seventh plague. If God had sent the seventh plague before he separated Israel's animals from Egypt's animals, in Exodus chapter 9 and verse number 19, then Israel would have lost a lot of livestock. But God always has an order of things. God always is aware. God always is thinking about the next thing. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus revealed that there will be an order to the end of the world. When he said, in this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. God even has an order in bringing praises to the throne. Matthew recorded the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 24. Let, leave thy gift there before the altar and go thy way. First be rec reconciled to thy brother and then come to offer your gift. Jesus said if you got a problem with your brother, then God has an order for praise. He doesn't want to hear you praise until you take care of that problem with your brother. God has an order. There is nothing with God that is helter-skelter. With God, there is no disorder. With God, there is no confusion. Paul wrote in the book of 1 Corinthians that God is not the author of confusion. Even when we assemble together as Christians in church, God told Paul to tell us that everything from the singing to the tongues and interpretation is to be done decently and it's to be done how? In order. With God, everything has an order. God's plan always has an order. Our simplistic, human, finite thinking mind often cannot comprehend the reason for the order of God's plan or for the order of God's will. But make no mistake about it, God's plan and God's will always has an order. When God says no, to the thing that you have asked him for, it is not because he is not able to do it. It is not because he does not understand your need. It is not because he doesn't care about you or your need. When God says no to the thing that you have asked him for, it is not because he doesn't love you as much as he loves someone else. When God says no, it is because whatever you have asked him for does not at that time, nor may it ever, fit into God's order, into God's will, either for you individually or for the work of God. When God says no to the thing that you've asked him for, the thing that you feel he should give you, 
When God says no to your healing, to your miracle, when God says no, it is because what you've asked him for does not fit into God's order, into God's will, either in your life or for the good of his work. Someone say amen if you believe that. Now I appreciate the ones who said amen. But if you're like me, even if you do believe what I'm telling you, it doesn't mean that it makes you feel any better. It still hurts when God says no. I read for you 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. It is a passage where we see the Apostle Paul shows us just how human he really is. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that he had a situation in his life that he called a thorn in the flesh. Now, the only place in the King James Version of the Bible where the phrase thorn in the flesh is found is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 7. Paul wrote that a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. There is no indication in Bible history of what the thorn was that Paul was talking about. Now, the most common belief is that Paul's thorn had something to do with his eyesight. We do know that most of the books that were written by Paul were not really penned by Paul, but they were penned by someone else doing Paul's dictation. The ailment that Paul had is not important. The way that Paul reacted to his thorn is what is important. Verse number eight reads, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times and it might depart from me. The Greek word for the translated to word pleaded here is parakaleo. Parakaleo, and it means to call out. It means to implore. It means to beg. And using the word parakaleo, Paul was writing that when he asked God to take his thorn away, he did it in a very demonstrative, in a very loud, in a very expressive way. Much like the way we do when we need something from God. Paul called out to God. He pleaded with God. He begged God to heal him. And God said, no. We'll never fully understand why God says no to most of our desperate requests. But Paul's response to God telling him no in verse number 9 illuminates to us with how God's decision works in perfect harmony with God's order and God's will. Paul wrote, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will gather boast in my, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God told Paul, no, I will not heal your infirmity. And then God opened doors of ministry to Paul that allowed him to write more than half of the New Testament, giving instruction and giving in guidance giving guidance to us as we navigate our walk with God. The message that I hope you will walk away with today is not the answer as to why God says no to our deepest and our most desperate needs, but rather that when God does say no, it is because there is something in his answer that is attached to his order and to his will that we have been privileged to carry out for him. God told Paul, no, I will not heal your ailment. And then gave him a ministry that let Paul be known as the apostle to the Gentiles, bringing the message of salvation that trickled down to you and to me. Had there been no apostle Paul, you and I may not be sitting under the grace of God right now. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. God told the king David, no, you cannot build my house. And then he allowed David the honor of being the one who would write the blueprints. David's the one, Brother Mike, that wrote the blueprints for the house. He is the one who wrote the plan for that first great temple of God. And not only that, but God gave King David the task of being the one who would purchase the threshing floor from Arur, the Jebusite. And that is the place where that temple would be built. He said, you can't build my house, but I'm going to let you buy the place that's going to be built. 
And not only that, but God allowed King David to gather the materials in great abundance so that his son Solomon could use to build the temple. God told David no. And then he blessed him to do things that would work in perfect harmony with his order and with his will. Amen. 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 Jesus told the disciple, no, you cannot have time to go bury your father. Bible history doesn't record it, but I guarantee that this disciple played a part in the success of Jesus' ministry on earth. When God says no, you can believe that there is something that God has planned that works in his perfect order and in his perfect will. When God says No. A few months ago, my wife went to the doctor for a routine physical. And during that physical, a mass was discovered in her abdomen. And the doctors went about trying to figure out what it was. She went through examinations and ultrasounds, and MRIs. And finally, a nice cancer doctor at Duke named Dr. Previs said, Well, we think we know what it is, but we're not sure. We think it's not cancerous, but we're not sure. So we need to schedule surgery to learn more and hopefully do something about it. We think we know what it is, but we're not sure. We think that it's not cancerous, but we're not sure. We think, we think, but we're not sure. Let me tell you something, honey, you do not want to be in a situation where a cancer doctor at Duke Hospital is using so many we thinks and we're not sure when they're talking to you. Well, surgery was scheduled and we continued praying and believing for God to perform a miracle. I would wake up at night and I would hear Patty weeping and praying, asking God to heal her. She didn't know what was going on inside of her when the doctor's not willing to rule out cancer in your prayers, your prayers get real serious when that happens. Your prayers get real desperate. And mine and hers did. I feel like she was like Paul. She's crying out to God. She was pleading with God for a healing And I'm here to tell you this today, up to the very moment, up to the very moment that they rolled her back to that operating room and put her to sleep for surgery, she and I and Amber and David, who were there with her, up to that very moment that they put her to sleep, we along with some of you believed that they were going to begin that surgery and they were going to find out that God had healed her. And then the rejoicing would begin. We believe that with all of our heart. We had prayed. We had asked God for a miracle. And we believed that God was going to give us one. And God said no. David and Amber and I met with Dr. Privis in the consultation room after the surgery was over. And she explained to us that she had removed a mass the size of a cantaloupe from Am- from Patty's ovary. I got the smallest cantaloupe I could find today at Food Line. The pathology report indicated that the weight of that cantaloupe size mass was almost one and a quarter pound.
Dr. Privis explained that the mass was so hard that she could not aspirate it, but rather she had to cut Patty in a way that she could take it out whole. So she could take out that cantaloupe-sized mass. Thank God, after waiting for about a week and a half, we finally learned that the mass was not cancerous. Thank God for that. The title of my message today is When God Says No. My wife, who is one of the most godly, heavenly, God-minded women I have ever met. My wife asked God for a miracle, and God said no. We don't know why God said no. But let me tell you some things that we do know. That all along this journey, Patty has come in contact with doctors and physician assistants and nurses and x-ray technicians and receptionists and financial representatives and janitorial staff and food service staff and other patients and other families of patients, all of whom were greeted by and comforted by a Christian woman who talked about the love of God and the miracle working power of God and the peace that we have when we know Oh God, we don't know why God said no. You cannot have this miracle. But we do know that that last nurse that she had the day that she came home from the hospital was a nice young man who had recently moved here, I think, from California. And he told Patty that he was having sort of a difficult time uh, uh, adjusting to his move. Y'all remember that? We don't know why God said no, you cannot have this miracle. But we do know that God worked it out so that when it was time for her to be wheeled down to the van, there were no transportation personnel available. So that nurse had to be the one to do it. And so all that way, as he was rolling her down, Patty was talking with him. And she was encouraging him. And she was talking with him about finding a place of worship. And she was saying, you, you're going to be okay. And everything's going to be all right. You're going to adjust to this. It's going to be, not going to be any problem. Patty was coming down from having her gut split wide open. Because God said, no, you can't have a miracle. But he, she was witnessing. And she was testifying to a nurse that might have needed it at that moment. I gave him a church business card, but it doesn't really matter whether he ever visits Harvest Christian Ministries or not. What does matter is that he came in contact with a real child of God who showed him, not only talked about it, but showed him the love of God. We don't know why God said, no, you can't have this miracle. It just might be because a lonely nurse at Duke Hospital needed to hear about the love of God that day. Why does God say no, Pastor? I don't know. I don't know. Patty and I were talking about it the other day. That is the one question, Brother Billy, that if we could ever get the answer to, we'll know one day. I don't know, but when God says no, it is because he has a purpose that will work perfectly in his order and in his will. Let's stand and worship him right now. Praise God. Come on, let's take a minute and worship the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I know I'm going longer than normal, and I apologize for that, but I'll tell you one more story that's not even in my notes. I found out this week that a good friend of mine, his name is David. We were very close when we were young. In fact, I worked for him 
at a Harris Teeter in Cary. We played softball together. We played basketball together. We played golf together. We were good friends. We've sort of gotten apart now. We've, we've moved apart. But I found out today, or this week, that David, he already had two tumors in his brain. He's got one. Another one has come up in the front side of his brain. And they're going to have to go take it out. Patty told me that David can hardly care for himself. And I want to tell you something about David. He was a good man. He is a good man. He's a man that I know paid his tithe. He's a man that I know would do anything for the church. He preached some messages. He taught some Sunday school. For over 20 years, Brother Mike, Brother Billy, Brother Blake, and Brother Corey, he cut the church grass. And I mean it wasn't a small church. It's large. But every week, he cut that grass, and it was perfect. And now today, on June the 18th, He's scheduled to have brain surgery. Why doesn't God heal him? I don't know. He doesn't know. In fact, he said to his wife, I don't understand. I've lived a good life. I've done everything I was supposed to do. Why am I going through this? Why? He's only, I think he's, what, Becky? I think he's probably only about 60. He's 61. 61 years old. He's only four years older than I am. I wish I could get to him, and I'm gonna to plan to try to go see him, but I wish I could get to him and say, David, I don't know why God said no, but listen, God has a plan. God has an order. God knows what he's doing. Realizing that God says no is never easy. But knowing that God has everything that goes on in our life in His control is amazing. Some of the most comforting scriptures to a child of God are found in Jeremiah chapter 21, 39, verses 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope that you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Church, listen to me this morning. Sometimes God's order, God's will requires that he tells us no. But we are comforted in knowing that even when God says no, He's still thinking of us and His thoughts are for our peace and towards our future. And we can have a hope because when we pray to God, He will listen to us. And when we seek Him and when we search for Him with all of our heart, we will find Him. Aren't you glad today that we serve a God who knows where we are and who cares for us? Let's give the Lord some praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Even in the midst of my no, still I will trust him. Can you say that even when the no comes? Still, still, I will trust you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want everyone who will to come to the altar. Let's sing this with her as you come. Come on. Still, I'll trust you, Lord.